In this video we're going to look at a simple specification and produce an object orientated program to implement the specification. A computerized board game uses dice to dictate the movement of a counter around the board. Develop a class that allows for the creation of a six sided die that can be thrown. And just as an aside, remember when you talk about an individual die, you use the word die. When you talk about more than one die, you use the word dice, and dice is the plural. Because often you will see people refer to one die as a dice, when in fact it isn't. When you say dice, it means more than one. Let's now consider a die. We've got one here and what we know is we throw this particular die and when we throw it, it will stop and we look at the side that's pointing up and that's the value we actually will choose. So here, for example, we would choose five because we can see there's five dots on this particular side. The next thing to do is to consider what the format of a class would be to represent a particular die like this. And I'm going to show that here with this UML-like class diagram. And the first thing we can see is I'm going to call this class die. I'm then going to have an attribute, which is the side. And of course, that's going to hold whatever the side is that's pointing up. And of course, if we consider the behaviors of a die, we know it can be thrown. So I'm going to have a method called throw. And also, once it is thrown, we need to have a look at what the side is. And we're going to have this get value, which will return the side that's actually pointing up as we look at the die after it's been thrown. So we can see here that this is the attribute, and these two are the behaviors. Or when we move over into coding, this is going to be a variable, and these two here are going to be the methods. Let's now revisit the actual class diagram, but from the perspective of Python programming. And you can see I've got it here. And there is an alteration. The alteration is as I have included this initialization method, which we have looked at previously in the playlist. And also you can see that the word self has been included in these two methods here, as well as, of course, self being in the initialization method. If I now look at the Python code that will implement this particular definition of a class, you can see here. And straight away, the class has been called die. We then have this method here, the initialization method, which we can see appeared here in the class diagram. We have this throw method, which appeared here in the class diagram. And we have this get value method, which appeared here in the class diagram. If we have a look at the initialization method, we can see that we've got self.side equals zero. Now, this is going to hold the value of the die when it's been thrown. And here you can see I'm initializing it to zero. If we have a look at this method, which is the throw method, on this side you can see that we have some code, which I'm not going to explain in detail here. All I'm going to say is that this will generate a random number that's either 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. In other words, it behaves as the random number generator. That, in fact, that's what a die is. It's a random number generator, isn't it? And this is what this is going to do. And, of course, whatever this returns, we're going to assign to this particular variable here, the self.side. Now, the get value, what that's going to do, it's going to return the self dot side so we would call this method after we've thrown the die to see what the value was that was thrown now of course I could have altered this class if I wanted I could have got rid of this method and I could have put the return inside the throw method but I'm choosing to do it this way because I think it kind of mirrors what you do when you throw a die you throw it it stops then you have a look at its value. I'm quite happy with that approach. And what happens when you write object-oriented programs, it's often the case that you try and mirror what you've actually got in reality, if you like. There's a lot more to be said on that, but this is only a straightforward program, so you can think of it in those terms at the moment. What's important now, if we're going to write object-oriented programs, we have to realize that this code here is the code for the class. And of course, when we go on to write our code, 
that's going to use this class, we have to produce an instance of this class. In other words, an object. And that's what I'm going to do next. So if we have a look at this particular program here, what we can see, we have the same class definition that I've just been discussing. And now I want to have a quick look at this here. You see, random is an example of a module that exists in the Python language. And if I want to use all of the features that this allows me to use, such as this here, the ability to generate a random number, you have to put up here, import random. And that's saying that my program wishes to use all of the functions that are defined in the module random. Now, so far in the playlist, I've not looked at modules. But if you come down here again, you can see it's got a dot notation. And this dot notation is similar to the dot notations you have when you discuss object-orientated programming. But this is slightly different. This side of the dot is the name of the module, and on this side is the name of the function that you're going to use, and that function will have been defined in that particular module random, which we have to import here. If you don't import it here, this program won't work. This bit of the code here will say, well, I don't know what random.randint is, because you haven't put the word import random here. Now let's consider this program executing. And the first line to execute is this one here. My underscore die is assigned die. And of course, this creates the instance of the die class. So if we go back to the execution space, which we have been considering throughout this playlist, as you can see here, what this line is going to do, it's going to produce the object, which I like to show as this circular shape here. And of course, this object is going to be bound to the name my underscore die. So this name is bound to this object. Now, of course, this object is based on this class. So what's going to happen is the object is going to have the initialization method, as you can see here. Now, the initialization method has within it this self.side. And, of course, that means that this particular object is going to be representing that variable, as you can see here. We've also got this throw method defined in the class. So that throw method is going to appear here in the object. Likewise, the class definition has got the get value, and that get value is going to appear here in the actual object. Now, when this line creates this particular object, we will know that self.side is assigned zero. And we can see that assignment of the zero appearing here now. This line now executes, and of course, this is a message to the object to which this name is bound. And the method that will be executed is this throw method here, which we can see in the diagram appearing here. And of course, the throw method is defined in the class. Now, this particular bit of code will generate a random number that's either 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. And that then will be assigned to this particular variable. Now, for argument's sake, let's say that this generates a number randomly and it happens to be 6. So if we come over here now, what will happen is that this variable will be changed to 6, as you can see. This line now executes, and this is a message to the object. And the method that will be invoked is this one here, the get underscore value. And of course, that is defined in the class here. And what this definition tells us is that we're going to be returning this variable. And of course, this variable has the value of 6. And that 6 will be returned to this particular variable die underscore value. Then we go on to this line, and what this will do, it's going to print out the string the value is, together with the die value, which we have just seen has been assigned 6. Consequently, the output from the program is shown here. This line creates the object, the instance of the die class. This is a message to that object, the object 
then has its throw behavior activated. The die then takes up an appropriate value. This is a message to that object which gets the value that has just been thrown, returns it to this variable, and this line then displays what the output is. So we can see we have object creation, messaging the object, and messaging the object again. Now, when we look at this message, this is a message that changes the state of the die. It alters this variable. And on the example we used, it altered it to 6. Now, this particular message didn't alter anything in the object. It just returned something from the object. And that illustrates two important kinds of messages. You have messages that alter the state of the object, and you have other messages that goes and gets values from the object. I'm just going to amend the program slightly, and we can see the program here, and the amendment is here. You can see I've introduced a loop. Everything else is the same, the class is the same, but on this line we create the instance of the die class, i.e. the object. Here we throw the die, then we go and get the value of the die, then we display it. Of course, then we go back to here, we throw the die again, we then go and get the value of the die, and then we print its value. So the runtime will typically look something like this. And if you look at the numbers there, you can see that we appear to have every number generated from 1 through to 6. Of course, if you run the program again, you won't get the same numbers thrown as you can see here. But again, what I would like to emphasize, the object is created, we message the object, we message the object, we go around the loop, we message the object again, then we message the object again. And when you're talking about object-orientated program, this notion of messaging object is important. You'll hear lots of people not use the term messaging, they'll use the term calling, but in the object-orientated world, especially if you follow the production of code through UML artifacts, where communication and messages are a key feature of those diagrams, then getting used to the notion of messaging as opposed to calling is important. So you message an object, and of course when you message, you will be invoking a method that's in that object, where that method has been defined in the class, the notion of messaging is important in object-orientated programming. Check out the supporting website for these videos, and also consider subscribing to the YouTube channel and the Google Plus Circle that relates to these videos. In addition, why not follow me on Twitter as I issue a tweet every time I upload a new video.